If you would turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Psalm 1, if you just let your Bible open to the middle, it'll open to a psalm, and then you either go, you go backwards, if it's Psalm 8, to Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is the first psalm, that's why they call it Psalm 1. And John Calvin called it the gateway psalm. He said that what is contained in Psalm 1 is a structure that if you understand and you live that way, the rest of the Psalms, in fact, the rest of the Bible will open to you. We must understand that Psalms are poetry. They are poetry that classically were put to music. There are also different kinds of Psalms. And Psalm 1 is a wisdom Psalm. Psalm 1 gives you instruction on how to live as a wise person. We also can understand that because it is Old Testament, they speak of things like the law. They speak of things like blessed men. These things are cultural. That as Christians, we can say blessed person. When they say law, we can actually say the Bible. And it would fit quite well. For we are not saved by the law. God's love for us does not increase with the law. The law died on the cross with Christ. He positively followed all of the things in the law so that when we stand before God, we have his obedience of the law on us, not from us, not because we are righteous, but because he is because it is poetry, every culture has come up with a style of poetry. Hebrew poetry is unlike any other poetry, just like Japanese poetry with the haiku is unlike any other type of poetry. Uh, we have in America kind of more of a free verse and a prose style that is American poetry. And when you look at Hebrew poetry, almost every psalm has a thing called parallelism. What that means is just saying something once is not good enough for the psalms. They got to say it one way, then another way, then another way. Parallel meanings, same main point. And 99% of the psalms do this. And if you were singing this, if this was something that Psalm 1 that we would open, as it were, our church service, singing it, then the repetition would get into your brain and you would learn how to be righteous three different ways in this passage. And so the parallelism or the re repetition is something that is used in Hebrew poetry. Also, there is something called a chiasm. You don't have to know what a chiasm or how to spell chiasm. But what it means is, and especially in Psalm 1, is that you have uh, A, B, two aspects of the righteous person, and then B prime, A prime, two aspects of an evil person. So it, it kind of go, walks this way, then walks back using Righteous people, evil people, in the same format. And it's a style of parallelism, and we'll look at it in a moment. One, also, one thing that you also have to see in the Psalms is that uh, you will see in your Bible uh, either, sm that's called small caps, or you'll see the word Lord in all caps. When you see the word Lord in all caps or small caps or a different typeface, sometimes it'll be bold, capital L-O-R-D in your Psalms. When you see that, that is the name of God that he gave to Moses at the burning bush. When Moses was at the burning bush and God was giving him these instructions, he said, who do I say sent me? And he said, I am that I am. And the I am in Hebrew is Y-H-W-H in, in, in English transliteration. 
no vowels, just Y-H-W-H, four letters. And it is such a holy name that Jewish people would never write it. So they would write capital L-O-R-D as a code that this is the true name of God, the high name of God, the covenant name of God. And when it is used in the Psalms, the author is not talking about an aspect of God like his strength or his might or his love. He's talking about the full person of God, the backing of the full covenant, the full power of God in this particular passage. There are basically three names of God that are used in the Psalms. Capital L-O-R-D is the most common because when a song is being sung, when poetry is being memorized, making sure it is to the one true God, the monotheistic, the one God, by name is what they would do. And when people were uh, copying this psalm, for example, 3,000 years ago, after they wrote L-O-R-D, they would have to go and sterilize their pen because they felt that the, the, the defects of their hand, the dirt of their hands, could somehow corrupt the name of God. Uh, we have a different understanding because of the blood of Christ. And so we come to Psalm 1. And it starts in Psalm, in verses 1 and 2, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. If you were to line up ten Christians today and say, do you ever use the word blessed or blessed? They would say, sure. You know, sometimes when people sneeze, we say, bless you. When we pray, we, we say, bless the Lord. Then you say, what does it mean? And you would either get ten blank stares, or you would get ten different answers. Blessing, blessed, is one of those words that is used throughout Scripture. It is in almost every book of the Bible. And it is a, an umbrella word, it is a covering word, like grace. Grace is not a specific thing. Everything we get as the free gift of salvation comes through grace. I'm saved by grace, and if I say, what is that? We could say the blood of Jesus Christ, saved by grace through faith. In the same way, blessing is that sort of word. It has a very wide interpretation, and modern people would say happy. Uh, modern translations of the Beatitudes in the New Testament say happy, instead of blessed, but it means deeper than that. What blessings are is spiritual treasures from God is the simplest way to put it. Uh, you're listening to a Christian song and your spirit is uplifted. You feel like worshiping. That is a spiritual treasure from God. You didn't make that up. It didn't come out of your own soul. It came from God, the desire to worship Him. That is a blessing. When people come to church and say, I was blessed, it may mean that they learned something or see a passage in a new way. And so when blessing is the, is the goal of this psalm, we need to look at the rest of the psalm to see what spiritual treasures, what things from God people are going to get. Because this is a wisdom psalm, this psalm is for every believer. Old Testament believers, New Testament believers. It starts with, blessed is the man. And as we look further, the blessings that you will get are most likely things like purpose and success. That if I follow these things, I will be successful in following God. And God will make me successful. And so instead of saying, blessed is the man, we could actually say, the successful Christian does these things because these truths are universal for all who follow God. And since we are Christians today, 
we can say instead of blessed is the man, we can say blessed is the Christian who does these things. And in the same way, this will not save you, but this will deepen your walk with God if you do what this psalm says. And the three things that it says is do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. In other words, don't listen to, don't take the advice of wicked people. If a wicked person is trying to tell you something, trying to sell you something, trying to convince you of something, put your fingers in your ears, go la, 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 and don't listen to wicked people as they try to tell you things. Now, you may have to listen a little bit to realize what they're saying is false or evil or trying to bring you into a sin. But as soon as you recognize it, you walk away. And you seek advice from righteous people, from godly people. There needs to be in your mind a handful of godly people that you can ask advice from if you have a difficulty, if you have an issue. And if you only seek from godly people, you will be one-third of the way toward having a successful Christian life. Number two, it says, stands in the way of sinners. That has to do with doing the sin. If I am getting in with robbers or liars or cheaters or thieves, I become part of their activity. Then I am standing in the way of sinners, people who wake up in the morning and, and try to figure out what they can do to advance themselves that if they can advance their own position, which is always sinful to advance myself, I must work to advance God and His agenda, not me and my agenda. But there are people, quite a lot of them, who wake up every morning thinking of how they can advance their own agenda, and they will try to get people to join them. Because it's easier, if you're going to do evil things, to have more people involved in doing it. And it may be the same people who want to give you bad advice to join them. But if you wake up in the morning or at the end of the night, at the end of the day, when you're looking back at what you did and you realize that you've hung out with sinful people and God really wasn't first, you've really tried to advance your own pride, then you're falling into the trap of number two. And so a positive way to say the first one is only take advice from godly people that you can trust. And number two, only hang out with and participate with godly people that are doing good. That if at the end of the day you can think and say, yeah, I did good today, I did God's work today. And it was a good thing I did, and I helped this person, and I prayed with this person, and I prayed for this person, and I visited this person, and I called this person to encourage them. These are good things that we can do. And it is the second, two out of three. And the third is sitting in the seat of scoffers. Scoffers are people who sit. Back then it would be at the city gate. Today it might be in a street corner. It might be somewhere. And you just, you look at people and you always find something to make fun of them about. You, you, you cut down people in your mind as they walk by, as you see them go into a store, as your first thought about somebody when you see them is to make fun of them, at least in your mind. These are the scoffers and the mockers. And that is a sin. To do that is a sin to cut down in your mind the image of God like that. For all people have been created in the image of God no matter what condition they are in now. And so to say that positively, you would be uh, the type of person who every time they see somebody would try to figure out a way to bless them, would pray a blessing upon them, would lift them up would raise in, their mind, in your mind their statue. Scoffers always end up being gossips, always end up being rumor mongers. 
They like to talk about people behind their back, and Christians, when they ever talk about somebody behind their back, always do it in a blessing way, in a way that lifts them up in the eyes of the hearers. Uh, it is not sinful gossip if you are talking about somebody in a glowing way, lifting them up in the eyes of people. Gossip always tears down. And so if you're taking godly advice all the time, if you're always doing good and hanging out with people who are doing good, and if you're always thinking the best about people and lifting them up in the minds of other people, then you will be, in many ways, a successful Christian. Your day will go quite well, and you'll be able to look at the end of the day, and you will think, God really used me during this day because of these things. Of course, nobody can do that all the time. Jesus Christ did. But none of us can do it all the time because we have this desire to advance ourselves. And so you don't do these things. These are stated in the negative, that you don't get advice from wicked. You don't hang out with sinners. And you don't act like a scoffer. But, it says, he delights in the law of the Lord. We would say we delight in the Bible. How do you delight in the Bible? Well, you look forward to reading it. As it was said, to opening the service, you, you figure out a quiet time. You figure out a time when you can open the Word of God and find the treasures that are in there from God. You are blessed, I guarantee it, by regular Bible reading because God will grow you and strengthen you and speak to your heart and you will learn and you will get strong. And it says, and on his law he meditates day and night. This is an idiom, a Jewish poetic idiom. It means every spare moment, basically. It doesn't mean you're doing it 24-7. It means that you can set a time in the morning to do it, and you can set a time in the evening to do it, but it's regular. You are doing it day and night if it is regular. If you can look back over the last week, last 10 days, and say, yes, I spent time with God in His Word once or twice every day for the last 10 days, then you are doing it day and night in that idiomatic way of thinking about it. Christians need to be people who pour over Scripture, who love Scripture. When we get together, it would be fabulous if you don't talk about what you saw on TV or what movie you saw, but what you read last night in the Bible. And to say, yeah, I was just reading Psalm 1. And it spoke to me, this specific part just spoke to me. And then we can rejoice together in our Bible reading. And then, in verse 3, we have a simile. Remember similes back from elementary school English? Similes use the word like or as. If you do this, if you're this way, if you're into the Bible all the time, you are like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. You are not a tree. It doesn't say you'll turn into a tree, but it says that you're like a tree. And in what ways are you like a tree? Uh, many years ago, I was working at a company in San Jose and somebody from Texas moved out here to work at that company. And he said the, the thing that amazed him the most is he heard that California was a desert but it says there's trees everywhere, and there's even trees in people's front yards and backyards that if you go out our front doors, you see 15 trees in people's yards, that there are trees everywhere, and that's because we are a coastal state, and there's a lot of water, especially in the Bay Area with the big old bay, that the trees love it, they love the water. And if you go to places like Muir Woods and see the big sequoia redwoods, uh, those are huge trees, and I don't know if you ever tried this, but walk up to one and try to push it over. Can't do it. It is solid because of the water that it has and because 
It has deep, deep roots. And so we are like that sort of tree because when the adversities of life, when the disappointments, when the things that we just don't want to happen, happen to us, we can stand firm. We don't make God the first thing to go. There are, there's a practice, and I have met people who do this, that when a tragedy strikes, God is the first to go because God didn't prevent the tragedy. But see, if you're in the Bible all the time and you're being blessed by being in the Bible all the time, when these adversities happen, they gain a proper perspective. And you can see perhaps God working in it. And if you can't see that initially, you know that God's working in it because that's what the Bible says. And you yield your fruit in season. In other words, when God has you doing things, you do them. When it is appropriate for you to act, you act. When it is appropriate for you to speak, you speak. And your leaves never wither. In other words, you always are in bloom, you are always uh, ready to go and planted by the water. Uh, I have had occasion to drive through the Mojave Desert and Death Valley down so south of here. And uh, you drive through there and there are not a whole lot of trees. Uh, you've seen pictures perhaps of the, uh, the Sahara Desert, big old dunes of sand. Not a lot of trees, because trees need water. And in the same way, Christians need the Word of God. The Word of God is your water. The Word of God is what you put your roots down deep into. The Word of God gives you the stability that when somebody gives you bad advice, you can say, that doesn't seem right, I'm not going to listen to you, because I know the Word of God. And then verse 3 ends with, in all that he does, he prospers. Now, in America, in Western culture, you see the word prosper, and we think money. Because if I'm going to prosper, I want money. That's what prospering is today. 3,000 years ago, not so. It didn't matter how much money you had if you planted your seeds and the rain didn't come, and when harvest came, nothing sprouted out of the ground. You were going to starve as a family and have a difficult time. And if it happened to you, it was happening to everybody in town, so there was nobody to go buy grain from or to buy food from. They lived and died, rose and fell as a community. And so if you ask somebody 3,000 years ago, what does it mean to prosper? They would say, the seasons behaving like they're supposed to, spring, winter, summer, fall, in that order, the fact that grain would behave like it's supposed to, that their kids would be healthy, that they would have a lot of them, and they would be obedient to do the harvest. That's about it. Very simple prosperity views because they just wanted to survive. Even when Jesus walked the earth, Israel was very uh, poor. They, they did subsistence farming. They did just enough to get by. As we read the story of Joseph in, uh, in Egypt, if it wasn't for the dream and he was to save the grain then all of Egypt would have starved to death because if there is no grain and if somebody didn't save them like Joseph did, it didn't matter how much money you had, you would starve to death. And so when we think of prospering, we need to think of how we prosper in the life of Christ, how we prosper as a Christian. Uh, we, we consider money prospering because we have such an abundance of resources. But if we pause for a moment and say, what can I do or what would it look like if I were to prosper in Christ, if I were to prosper as a Christian, that might give us a different perspective that there are some things in this world that money cannot buy. There are some things in this world 
that riches, it might get you the car of your choice, it might get you the food of your choice, but it's not going to save your neighbor. You can't pay somebody to be a Christian, or it won't last at least if you try that. So we need to look at this word prosper from a godly perspective and understanding that being successful in God's way is not being necessarily successful in the world's way. And then in verse 4, it, tries, it, it, it says the opposite. We've talked about righteous people for three verses. Now we're going to talk about the wicked so that you can look at this and go, oh, I don't want to do that. The wicked are not so. So everything that is in verses 1, 2, and 3, the wicked are not that. But they are like chaff that the wind drives away. I don't know if you've ever harvested wheat. Uh, they harvested wheat back then when this was written. Wheat has a really tough stalk and a casing and this fluffy stuff on top that if you were to just take a wheat stalk and, and try to eat it, there'd be no nutritional value and you might cut up your mouth. And so what you have to do is break through the, the casing and get to the kernel of the wheat when you buy flour or wheaties or wheat checks or some sort of processed wheat in the grocery store. What they have done is they've taken away all the unedible stuff and gotten to the kernel of the wheat and then grind it up, make flour and make the food. And so what they would do in the time of, of David is there would be professional threshers. What you would do is bring tons of wheat, because you have a big old farm, and you pull it by a mule or ox, and you pull it to this thresher guy. And what he does is he has this big flat space, perhaps a rock, perhaps wood, perhaps hard ground, and he would pile up your wheat and then make all of his animals walk all over it. And that would break up everything. And then they would throw it up in the air. And all the unedible stuff would be flown away. It would go away in the wind. And the kernel, the edible part, because it is much heavier than the rest of it, would fall to the ground. And you would be left with a pile of edible wheat and all of the stuff that blew away is called chaff. Chaff is pointless, it is useless. When you throw it up in the air, it just disappears. And what the psalm is saying is that the work of the wicked, the things that the wicked do, are like this chaff. That if you really look at it, if you just set it aside or throw it up in the air or give it some sort of examination, it'll just kind of disappear. And especially at the end of time, that when God is judging the world, all of the people whose lives are chaff, are wicked, will be thrown into the fire. And so when we look at being blessed, a blessed Christian, it is op opposite of being a chaff Christian. We need to have the works from Scripture, we need to have the attitude from Scripture that if it is examined, if adversity comes against it, if the winds of the world comes against it, it doesn't just blow away, but it is solid like a tree. So verse 5, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. When you stand in the judgment, that means you are standing before God. And He is not judging you for salvation. He is judging you as children. To stand in the judgment means to stand in the presence of God. And only Christians, only people who have been saved by the blood of Christ, and if you when you get to heaven and you find Abraham and you find Jacob and you find Isaac and you say, how are you allowed to be here? They will say they are there by the blood of Christ. Hebrews around 11 and 12 tells the story of how the, the blood of Christ was held in account 
even 2,000 years before Christ lived so that people could be saved by that blood even in the Old Testament. Everybody who's in heaven is saved by the blood of Christ. And so we can stand in the presence of God because of the work of Christ. We can stand in the congregation of the righteous. If you read Revelation around 19 and 20, John said that he saw a great multitude of every nation and language and people, and they were singing praises to God. That is the congregation of the righteous. Only saved people get to be in that choir. And then verse 6, For the Lord, once again the covenant name of God, knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And this is a summary that I don't have to help people and then yell to the mountaintops for God to see it. I don't have to prove to God anything that if I am saved, if I am washed by the blood of Christ, God sees it, God knows it, God loves it, God is with you in it. And we don't have to do anything to get his attention. He knows what you're doing. He knows your way. He knows your activity. And it will remain. But the activity, the way of the righteous, of the wicked, will perish. There will be a time when those who rejected Christ will not be around anymore. That only people left living on earth and in heaven with God will be those who accepted Jesus Christ. God is going to make a division at the end of time that all those that rejected God will be thrown into the fire. And so two things from this. One, we need to realize that God is always watching. That when we do things, we don't do it for our own pride or our own recognition because that is a sin. We do it for the glory of God. And number two, that person you know who's unsaved has a dismal future. And we need to be the type of people who will tell them, share them, explain it to them, grab them and pull them along, as it were, so that they do not end up in the fire, but they can be part of the congregation of the righteous. This psalm gives us three activities that we can do that if we focus on what advice we hear, what people we hang out with, and what activities we are involved in, and we just keep a lid on those things, then we will go a long way to having a successful Christian day and a successful day for God, knowing that He sees it all. And we will truly be like a tree, like a giant redwood, planted by the coast, that anything can come and hit it, and it'll still be there a hundred more years. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you for this day, I thank you for this psalm, that your wisdom for our lives could have, was written 3,000 years ago, and it is still so true today that the world in many ways has not changed, and people certainly have not changed. I pray that you would make us aware of what we're doing, make us aware of what we're hearing, Make us aware of who we're hanging around with, that we may be successful as we serve you day to day. Lord, I thank you for this teaching, and I ask your blessing on the remainder of the day. We ask this through the blood of Christ. Amen.